Is there any sort of estimation of how many MGs are, are on the road today and, and in regular use every day, every weekend? Uh, MG is by far the most popular mark for classic cars. Um, there are, a, I should think they outnumber all the other classic cars put together by about two to one. Um, there are a lot of them. <laughs> and a lot of owners clubs as well around with, with many, many members. That's right. The um, biggest uh, one make car club in the world is the MG Owners Club and the second biggest is the MG Car Club. So there are a, a lot of enthusiastic owners. The thing I like about MGs is their shape, they're fun to drive and easy to maintain. This is the only model I've had. I've had this model for three years, although I've had ca classic cars previously. Cars need constant work to keep them in good condition. The car's over 30 years old, so therefore it will need many parts replacing as time goes on, but parts are easy to come by. The car didn't need any restoration. The, the car had already been restored when I bought it. I couldn't really face going through yet another restoration project. <laughs> there are no downsides really to owning it because the fun is actually working on the car. I mean, that's the bit I really enjoy is taking it apart and rebuilding sections of it. But as far as I'm concerned, there are no downsides to it at all. Well, the first thing you notice is all the headroom that you've got because it's a, a soft top, of course. So you get the feeling of being in a classic sports car and that's why everybody buys one of these cars. They, they buy it because it's different. It has a wonderful feel to it. What it doesn't have that modern cars have are things like power steering, servo assisted brakes, um, electric windows, air conditioning. But you'll forgive all that because of the, the feel of driving a wonderful classic British sports car. Um, it's quite an easy car to drive. It's a lot different from a modern hatchback because um, you've got its rear wheel drive for a start um, and so it, it, the handling of it is different. It tends to um, have quite neutral handling. It doesn't understeer or oversteer. But um, it's a lot more fun to drive and you've got to have your mindset to enjoy the car rather than just get in it with a view of going from A to B. When it, when it was new, it was uh, far and away better than all of the 50s and 60s uh, saloon cars and now it's got about the same performance as a modern saloon car. It keeps up with modern traffic very well because when you're cruising at motor speeds in motorway speeds in overdrive um, it's only doing about 3000 rpm so it was designed to do 100 miles an hour and at 70 80 miles an hour it's quite comfortable. Well, the gear change is, is very precise. It's a typical sports car box. It's uh, nice and notchy, it clicks in very well. And um, there's no sloppiness like you get in a modern front wheel drive car where the gear, gear lever is more of a porridge stirrer. I like MGs, you're driving a piece of history. Um, if it wasn't for um, like people like us who tend to look after the MGs and keep them on the road, you wouldn't have a nice stylish design like we have here. Um, mainly it's a C, the features being the bonnets because it has the bulge and the um, metal strip across the uh, bonnet. That's one of the signs of a C. It's a wonderful car to drive, slightly heavy, but I still enjoy driving it and we both have a lot of pleasure out of them. This is the second one we've owned. The first one was an MGB Roadster, which we had for three years. This one we've had for four months now and um, we've had to do a bit of work on it but that's only to be expected when you go into the sort of classic cars like this that are over 25 years old. This is a, a 1968C, probably maybe one of the um, original cars that was made at the time. There was only um, 3,000 Cs made and a lot of them were sent out to Canada. So they're quite a rare car to have really. But again, it's, um, it's just a pleasure to have them, really. <laughs> it didn't need any rest restoration when we actually bought it, but there's always work that um, Howard does on the car. So you must be prepared to sort of um, 
spend money on them to keep them on the road. Well, the midget's much smaller, as its name suggests, and it's also a different type of drive. It's much lighter, it's, it's more like a mini. Uh, it's very twitchy, it goes exactly where you point it. Um, you only have to move the steering wheel slightly. The um, pedals are more like on-off switches instead of um, accelerator and clutch. Um, and it, it's a lot more of a fun vehicle. Uh, the midget's better on country lanes and round town, but it's not got the long legs of a bee down the motorway. So um, the overall performance is about the same, but they have their strengths in different areas. I think it's the elegance of the engineering and the whole magic of MG for me is everything sporting. Yes, I've always, always liked the car. I've probably had about six in total, two MGAs, a B, a C, uh, a V8, and I'm currently also running one of the later RV8s. I spend probably five or six uh, weekends a year busily working on the cars, and then quite a lot of time through the winter months, just generally keeping on top of the work. This particular car, I did a full rebuild on, which took me about six years on and off, <laughs> probably more off than on. It should, it should take about two or three months if you worked at it full time, but then it isn't a hobby. This was a full rebuild that I did across a six year period. I bought the car originally at about, a, I think about 1,500 and it was a completely derelict mess. And uh, since then, through the work and the parts that I've put in, I've spent about 9,000 pounds in total to get it to where it is today. That is not including the time of doing the work. That's the fun of it, that's the love of it, that's the hobby. I get as much pleasure out of building them as I do of, of using them. And uh, use in summer, work on them in winter. Right, well, if you're thinking of buying an MG Midget, the main thing to look at is the bodywork. The bodywork's far more important than all the mechanical bits put together. Um, it costs a lot of money to restore the bodywork. Uh, and a lot of time. So the main thing to check out for is the sills. Make sure that they're all good and solid and that they're either in good original condition or that they've been replaced properly. Now to replace the sill you've got to take the wing off and part of this rear wing to get at it. So as you can see it's quite a big job. What you normally find is when you've got those panels off you find more corrosion behind there and the job turns into a marathon. So you've got to make sure that all these structural metal pieces are in good condition. As well as that, you need to look underneath here where the sill joins the floor because um, that's another place where it can get corroded and you end up buying new floor pans for it. All these parts are available and they're all relatively cheap, but by the time you've got somebody to put them on for you, the, the labour costs mount up. Behind the seats as well, at the back of the seats you need to just press your hand against it and check that it's not crunchy. Uh, that's a, a sign that the metal works corroding behind there as well. Uh, inside the boot you need to check round. In the corners of the boot make sure that there's no corrosion starting there and the boot floor at the back. The other place to check is the floor pans at the front of the floor and in the corner of the floor in the footwells. At the front of the car you need to check behind the front wheel and at the front section of the floor because it's a box section there and it can start to corrode from the inside out. Again that can be very expensive. So as long as you've got one with good bodywork you're most of the way there. We have a look inside the engine bay. This is a later MG Midget, and this has the same engine as a Triumph Spitfire. It's the Triumph 1500 engine. You need to make sure that um, the big ends haven't gone in this by revving the engine at about 3000 RPM and just checking that there's no telltale rumble. Look inside the engine bay. It's unlikely it's going to look as good as this one but inside all the corners check for corrosion, check the chassis legs for corrosion and also um, 
just check for oil leaks under here and make sure that there's no excessive oil or water leaks. Right, inside you've got to check the carpets for signs of leaks and dampness. Make sure there's no mildew there because that's a sign that water is getting into the car from where it shouldn't. Just check the seats, make sure there are no rips or tears in there. Um, and also check the hood and the tonneau and make sure there are no rips or tears in those. This is the only Model MG that I've owned, but I've owned this one from new. It was built in 1980, one of a limited edition of only 208 cars. The last ones that were made at, uh, by Leyland. Um, this one's now done about 87,000 miles. It's uh, served me very well as an everyday car, but I recently had it restored and now I'm uh, using it only on special occasions. I can't think of any downsides of owning an MG and I'd thoroughly recommend the experience to anybody who's got an interest in old cars.